Good evening um, and good evening to everyone who's um, joining us this evening. Um, it's really good of you to show an interest in this project, which I think is absolutely fascinating and utterly worthwhile. Um, and I've been involved with the Fromel project since 2008, so a long time, although now I'm no longer formally involved since um, December of 21. Um, <clears throat> but I want to share my story about the Fromel project, my engagement with my colleagues, um, what we set out to do and hope to achieve and how we did those things. And I'll cover those areas, including the identification process in the first part of this evening's presentation. Then we'll have a break and then afterwards, I want to talk a bit, a bit about the legacy of Fromel and the impacts of Fromel um, and, gem and loss generally on families and on people who care. So without further ado then, um, we'll start talking about the project and many of you will be very familiar with the Battle of Fromel and I'm not going to talk very much about that, it's not my area, but I will set a little bit of background for you. So um, if you don't know where Fromel is, um, this is northeastern France, um, the red dot is Lille and Brussels is over here somewhere. Um, so in moving to the, this little section here, you can see the city of Lille, and if you've never been, it's well worth a visit. And, <clears throat> excuse me, from El Village is almost directly due west of Lille, um, about 22 kilometres, so not too far at all. And looking more closely at the area, this is the village. Um, down here, you've got the village of Aubert, which of course was the scene of a equally as bloody battle in 1915. Um, the red right, rectangle, shows the, the site of the Fromel graves with Fromel wood immediately next door, just down here and VC corner off down here somewhere. So the, I'm going to talk about the project from 2008 to 2020. And my role in the project has been a scientific advisor to both the Australian and British defense departments uh, through different sections on both sides, but advising on everything to do with forensic archeology, span anthropology and human identification. And before I go any further, I must of course acknowledge all of the organizations who are involved or at least the main players at this stage. So the UK Ministry of Defense, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, Unrecovered War Casualties Australia, the Army Section, Oxford Archaeology, who undertook the archaeology and anthropology, um, LGC Forensics, and Ox, um, I think what they call, um, Salmark Orchid um, undertook the DNA analysis, but LGC did most of it. And Dr. Peter Jones was our consultant forensic um, molecular geneticist who advised um, on all of the aspects uh, to do with DNA in particular. And finally, of course, we have to, to thank the families and the friends of the missing soldiers of Fromel, because without them, there would be no project and we wouldn't be having this uh, discussion this evening. So a quick introduction to the bath, just in case you don't know very much about it. And I always think it's very unfortunate these, that these two images um, aren't in the same orientation, but they're not, they are what they are. So for this aerial photograph, um, this is, Pheasant Wood, and this is the site of the, the mass graves with Fromel Village being up here, or rather, yes, up here. Um, and there you've got the German trench and the um, British and Australian trench through here. Um, and again, it's a bit clearer on this one. Um, so you've got Fromel Village here and the site of the graves there. Um, the Bavarian troops here, the 17th, 16th and 21st, and the 5th, um, Australian and the 61st British, um, not very far away, just a few hundred metres at most, and in some places very, very close. So that's, again, just to help you orientate yourself from the period we're talking about, which is July 1916. So the casualties um, from this battle were fairly horrendous. Um, it took place in barely 24 hours. And it still represents the largest ever 
um, loss of life um, missing soldiers for, for, for Australia. And they've had nothing like this in any campaign since. The British lost far less, so 1,500 casualties altogether, as against five and a half thousand. And of course, we, we shouldn't forget the Germans as well. Um, approximately a thousand Germans wounded, um, some fatalities, and again, some missing soldiers. So losses incurred all round, but principally to, to the Australians. And these contemporary photographs and postcards um, just show you images from the time. Whoops. Um, and here you can see this horrible scene of, of dead, mutilated dead bodies, which is so typical of battles on the Western Front. And again, here you can see bodies lying, um, presumably to, to be buried um, after they've been um, through the processes determined by the International Red Cross, who determined exactly what had to be done when dealing with, with the dead, whether the, your own or, or the enemies. And I just put this image up here, um, sorry, to show that um, Adolf Hitler, of course, as many of you will know, Fawcett from Al, he was a messenger, so I don't think he was too close to the action, um, but it's interesting to, to, to speculate about what would have happened if he hadn't survived. But that's not what we're here for today. So how did the Fromal project arise? And principally, it was to do with Australian um, researchers who were absolutely committed and dedicated to find out what happened to the approximately 1600 soldiers who had no known burial place um, from this particular conflict. Um, and the one you will have all heard of is Lambus Englezos, who's a retired um, school teacher of Greek um, extraction, a fascinating character, very larger than life, and a real mover and a shaker. And he certainly moved and shook and made this project happen. And it took a lot of attempts for the researchers to persuade Australian army that there was a case merit that merited investigation um, near Fromal village. And there were three principal sources of information that they um, hung their arguments on really. The first were Red Cross records, which alluded to approximately 1,600 Commonwealth soldiers um, that had been buried by Germans. Um, there was, um, in the Munich archive, there was a, a, a note um, written by Colonel von Braun um, of the Bavarian infantry, and he ordered his men to prepare mass graves for 400 Englander British soldiers. And finally, there's some sequential aerial photography, which we'll look at in a moment, but I put these images up here to just really illustrate the sorts of scenes that would have taken place um, at the time. The, 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 the image at the bottom in the middle, which shows tramway with bodies being transported, dead bodies being transported to graves. Um, it's very unclear whether these relate to Fromal. Um, the only thing about them which suggests they might is that a large number of the soldiers are not wearing boots and only 15 of the 250 soldiers recovered at Fromal had boots on when they were excavated. Um, in all cases, they had very, very seriously injured lower legs and feet. So presumably the boots weren't considered to be um, demerit um, taking them off of these very badly damaged corpses. Uh, and again, this is a mass grave and you can see the bodies are lying in it and being backfilled and again, this is almost certainly not pheasant wood because we see no trees in close enough proximities. Um, but they're the kind of scenes that would have been um, around at the time, which would have, you know, sort of activities that would have followed in the wake of battles all across the Western Front. So the sequential aerial photography, of course, is the most convincing evidence from my perspective. And on the far left of the image there, where the star is, if you, that, black area is pheasant wood. And if you look just to the south of the, of the star, which isn't really the south, but the, the area of fields just here, um, sorry, you'll see nothing. Um, where you've got this line going through, ignore that, but it's a good marker. But the area by the star there is clear. There's no sign of any disturbance of the ground. And that was taken sort of 
a month before the battle. If you look at this image, um, which was taken um, a couple, about 10 days after the battle, same trees, much more clearly a wood, um, but look at this here, this highlighted area of disturbance. And with the eye of faith and knowledge, you can almost count eight features along there of disturbance. And then again, if we look at another image taken a month later, six weeks later, in fact, you see very little by the woodland apart from three rectangular areas of disturbance. And the reason for those will become clear later. So following um, the, the work by people like Lampus to persuade the Australians to do something about this, um, Guard undertook an evaluation of the site at Pheasant Wood, which clearly demonstrated the presence of eight graves and the likely burial of about 400, up to 400 soldiers. Um, and there was evidence recovered during the evaluation which suggested that some of them at least were Australian. And following on from that, um, I was in, brought into the project to advise um, and the contracts for the archeology span and the DNA analysis were put out to competitive tender, which I won't go into, but it's a very long and torturous process that had to comply with British, Australian and European Union regulations about such matters. So um, large teams um, representing both the Australian and British sides um, who formed the Fromel Management Project, um, who came to various conclusions and they awarded the contract for the archaeology and the anthropology to Oxford Archaeology, um, whom we'll talk more about them later. But the main principal aims of the project for the period in which I became involved were firstly to excavate and analyze the soldiers' remains and any artifacts associated with them, whether from uniform, from weaponry or personal artifacts. The second one was to attempt to identify as many as possible to the name by which they were known during life, um, which brings us on to concepts of what identity is. And again, we'll come on to this later on. And the final aim and obje objective is to rebury them in the New Fromel Cemetery. And I'm not really going to talk about that. That's a, a lecture on its own right, and I wouldn't be the person to give it anyway. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a lovely cemetery. If you haven't been, I would recommend it. Um, it's very typically Commonwealth war graves, um, but it is also very individual and, and quite moving, a very moving place to visit. So, as you would imagine, to achieve those three aims created huge amounts of activity. And if we start by looking at the top right image, the aerial photo, it's not an aerial photograph, it's a drone photograph, which is the modern equivalent, I guess. Um, and in the center, you can actually see the, the, the area um, of the construction of the new cemetery. So this was in 2009, um, probably in about May, June of 2009. Just above in the far right corner of that area, you can see the church um, and where the blue arrow points and the red rectangle, that's the site of the graves and the white conglomeration of buildings below that, but to one side, that is the temporary mortuary complex. And what happened with this project is in order to do this work, um, a road had to be constructed across a very wet field. And I mean very wet field um, that had to be strong enough to allow articulated lorries to go on it, um, carrying 360 cats and other other similar equipment um, and all the goods and um, you like port comes and everything that were necessary to, to make this thing happen. And again, the image on the left shows a close up for, of the, for, again, from a drone shot and the, the red rectangulars that were the, the grave site. You see the triangles, sorry, the, the rectangles um, of the, the graves themselves, which are numbered according to guards numbering system just for continuity. The bright pink area is the site of the temporary mortuary and, and the whole um, series of constructions is listed. And for information to, um, to construct this um, didn't cost anything like anyone expected because Oxford were able to procure through their French office um, a series of porter cabins 
from a recently um, used temporary school um, that were no longer required, which were just perfect in terms of the capacity, in terms of space. And we arranged the mortuary complex so that when the human remains were brought from the graves up to the mortuary complex, they went through and all the different spaces, workspaces, were laid out in a sequential order that matched the workflow. So your reception area, your signing in, the um, processing area where things were, were cleaned um, in the appropriate manners and an anthropology um, laboratory followed by the fines laboratory, the DNA storage facility, um, storage uh, and all the facilities that people needed to live and work, not to live, but to work on this project um, for most of the summer of 2009. And of course you had press offices, security um, booths, um, there were security cameras up, everything was gated, it was very secure because clearly we're, we're talking about human remains um, which are something that should be treated and accorded sanctuary and treated very properly. Nobody was allowed to see the work that was undertaken. Uh, it was all screened from public viewing in accordance with Home Office, British Home Office regulations. Um, and the, the whole operation ran very, very smoothly. Uh, our main problems, if you like, our main challenges were the weather, uh, which is typically for this area at this time of the year, just veered from being very, very hot to being very, very wet. Um, and in an area with high water table um, and very excessive rainfall when it came, um, that was a challenge and had to be dealt with accordingly with French drains, with sumps, with pumps. Um, and the graves were excavated under an enormous marquee at the end of the day. Uh, so uh, that just gives you a flavor of how, how things looked on the ground. So just to give you some idea of how things were done and some working shots to give you a flavor of things, uh, Oxford Archaeology, um, their approach to their, their application to, to do this project was to bring into their team of experienced archaeologists and anthropologists, uh, specialists in forensic applications from all over the world. So lots of people were involved who'd been involved with human rights abuse work in the Balkans and in places like that in Iraq um, and so on. And um, people I worked with, many of whom I trained. Um, so we had archeologists, anthropologists, we had archeological surveyors, uh, forensic photographers, and crucially a senior crime officer because in order to use DNA as a means of achieving identification, we had to treat this as a scene of crime where continuity and prevention of contamination were absolutely crucial. Um, they were completely non-negotiable. Everything was run very, very tightly. Um, logistics was very important, health and safety. We had to be aware of unexploded ordnance as well. And lastly, but not leastly, we had to have mortuary managers um, to look after the human remains and make sure the mortuary was run in accordance with all of the guidelines and regulations uh, and reflecting the treatment of human remains. So it was a brilliant team. Um, they supplemented what they had in house with the best people in the world, really. They couldn't have done a better job. And these are just working shots of surveying being undertaken and the, the shot of the archeologists just starting to, to excavate there. Um, just again, I put that one on because it shows you what the substrate was like. It was this heavy Ypres clay, um, very tacky, um, very difficult to work with. Um, you couldn't do things, for example, like sieving. Uh, so excavated, pops, you know, um, overburden and everything, which all had to be fingertips searched. You couldn't sieve it. Um, which created additional work, but of course it's vital that things like that had to be done. So the, the team were wonderful. They were all suited and booted in accordance with forensic principles. It was very, very hot and it must have been very, very uncomfortable, but nobody ever complained. Uh, the initial examination of both the skeletons, and they were all skeletonized as the, the, the soldiers, 
um, which made life a lot easier. Um, and the, all of the artifacts associated with them was done on site. And the reasons for that are principally around the deterioration of material, um, including human remains. And if you consider that the, the bodies and the artifacts had been in a, a fairly stable substrate for at that stage, 94 years. Um, and after the initial period of internment, everything would have quickly established an equilibrium um, and a certain amount of decay would have taken place. And then because the site was waterlogged, things would have been held at that point by the, the lack of oxygen in the substrate. Um, and so we got amazing preservation, as you can see from this cigarette holder case. Whoops, apologies, an oversensitive mouse. Um, and you can see there, you've got the ivory mouthpiece, which is well used. You've got silver plaque, a silver band around it. You've got paper, all surviving and the paper was legible, you could, you could read um, the, the manufacturer's details. Um, so that all had to be recorded in situ and then quickly be removed and taken to the conservation lab um, for further consolidation um, and cleaning and recording. And in objects like the little lead to heart, there were two of these, um, one of which contained crucifixes and another contained a lock of golden hair very personal objects um, in some cases. So the excavation took place over 17 hot, wet weeks from May to September in 2009. And we all became very familiar with Leo and the Fromel area, um, which is, is, is very, very interesting and a nice place to be. Um, and essentially six graves were excavated um, and they contained human remains with all the trappings that had survived the burial process and also the fact that these soldiers had been in a battle and a lot of damage to their bodies and everything with them had, had been incurred in many cases. And again, you can see their um, images. There's a rising sun badge, very corroded, and an Australian jacket belt buckle, um, which is a very important little artifact for determining uh, which country the soldier was fighting for. Um, and the reason it was so important was because the buckle was sewn onto the belt and the belt was sewn into the side seams. So it couldn't come off um, and it wasn't something that the soldiers could barter with or play cards for or something like that, which they did a lot with things like buttons. Um, so it was a very, very useful indicator. So just some examples for you to get you into the gist of things. Um, an amazing, amazing range of artifacts, really. The, the little coin purse that you see there contained a number of um, non-French or Australian coins, including um, uh, Turkish coins. And it's worth mentioning that some of the soldiers who died at Fromel had actually survived Gallipoli. Um, most of them were, were new recruits. So they'd, they'd been trained and, and sent over from Australia in, in 1915-16. And um, so they hadn't fought before from El. And again, sorts of things they carried with them. You can see a pen nib there, um, which again, very legible. You can see the manufacturers make. It's a Birmingham make. Uh, pen knife, very corroded. Um, and most poignant of all, the unused return half of a train ticket from Fremantle to Perth. And that was a real tearjerker. I think most people were um, quite upset when this was revealed. It was, it was tucked into the inside of a soldier's gas mask. Um, so in a safe place um, and possibly a reminder of the fact that one day he hoped to go home. Um, and I've also put this one on for you again, just to show the extraordinary preservation that they, there could be. Um, and this is what remains of a little prayer book in its cover. And again, a fascinating object. Um, it wasn't the only uh, document of this type, um, but you know, extraordinary preservation. So we excavated eight, eight features in total. Uh, two of them were empty. Um, six were graves, if you assume a grave contains human remains. Um, and five of them contained approximately sort of 48-ish burials. So 
between 44 and, and 52, as it says up there. And they're approximately nine meters long, one meter deep, um, and just under two meters wide. And again, you could got two layers of burials in the five graves that had lots of burials in, um, the blue being the lower la level. Um, and in grave six, which is one of the three, if you remember from the aerial photograph, um, there were just three burials. And there's every indication that those graves may have remained open for some time after um, the battle and after the period in which the others were filled and possibly left there in case further bodies were, were recovered. And again, just to, again, to give you the indication of the, the level of detail that could be recorded using modern survey methods and equipment. And this is from one of the graves showing the two layers of burials and the blue and the red show both prone and supine burials, uh, red being prone, and the, the mauve and the green show burials that were either on their left or right side. Um, and it would appear that the burials were carried with one person carrying the head end and one the foot end um, to the, the grave and then lowered into the graves. Um, some of them were still wrapped in tarpaulins, what remained of tarpaulins, um, and these were very, very badly damaged bodies. So moving rapidly on to the identification process, this was a challenge and it was, um, we were very honored to be asked to do it. Um, I'm fortunate that, that there existed protocols for such things that had been determined by the ICRC, the Red Cross, and by the International Commission for Missing Persons. And we were able to take, if you like, the, the most appropriate and what we consider to be the best methods from each and to work out new approaches for our particular data sets. And you can have generic identification processes um, that assume certain data sets. But at the end of the day, you have to use whatever method works with your data sets. And so myself and Peter Jones developed this methodology, um, which is what we applied. And, and as you'll see, going from the bottom to the top, the first thing was the, if you like, broadly three data sets. The first, which related to the buried men, which included anti-mortem data about them. So records from enlistment, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, their, their, their bodies and their DNA. Um, and then you had all the data for the missing soldiers. Now, 250 buried soldiers, over 1,600 missing soldiers from Fermel. Um, and you had all of their information from enlistment and from other military records and from families occasionally. So that's a second data set. Um, and then you had the data and information, if you like, data set provided by the families of the deceased which were the DNA profiles for matching against the soldier's DNA. And it's worth stating at this point that at the outset, we were very unsure about whether DNA would survive in those wet clays um, well enough to, to be useful um, at the outset. And then it wasn't until we started the, the excavation that we were able to, we, we did a pilot study of the first, I think it was about 20 burials that were exposed, um, different type, Samples were taken from different bones and teeth that were, very, that were sent off to be analyzed very, very quickly to see which was the best area to, to get DNA from, um, where it survived best and most usefully, which turned out unsurprisingly to be the teeth because the dentine in the teeth is protected from ingress by bacteria and by chemical um, disruptive processes by the enamel and by the bony crypt from the jaws. Um, so that, that was what was used. So these data sets then were our, if you like, our material. And we had a data analysis team, which I chaired. Um, Peter was deputy chair. And we analyzed, we collated the data and we analyzed the data. Um, and our starting point had to be suggested matches that were suggested by DNA matches. And that might, may sound straightforward, but very often, given the, the nature of DNA from historical context, you could have one particular burial and DNA matching them, on, particularly on the maternal line, from half a dozen, some cases more, um, families, because maternal profiles are very mitochondrial 
DNA can be very, very common. Um, so uh, we had to analyze this and, and went through rigorous processes. Everything was absolutely fully recorded. Um, so um, those records are, can be interrogated. They are, of course, confidential records because they're part of a, uh, a military board of inquiry on the Australian side. Um, and after we'd undergone the process of collation and analysis, we would make recommendations, provisional recommendations to the Joint Identification Board, um, which comprise three star generals and above from both initially from both the British and the Australian armies. Um, that was until 2014, at which point the British, after which the British stopped being involved directly. Um, and there were at least two of those um, um, and I would make the recommendations, review all of the evidence to support those recommendations to the board. Um, they would ask me lots and lots and lots of questions and want to look at the information. Um, and this process took a long time. And, um, and then they would decide whether to accept the recommendations or not. Um, we were having to keep the Commonwealth War Graves Commission abridged of how many we thought we would have every year so they could brief their their, their stonemasons to start prepping the new headstones um, because usually the ID process took place in around Easter and of course every July there would be a ceremony to commemorate the new headstones um, and the naming of, the, of those particular soldiers. So once the identifications had been proposed and accepted then of course people would be informed, the families, the governments, um, other um, entitled agencies um, were all recovered, including, of course, the media, the media. And that kicked off another process, getting the, the, the new headstones ready for the July ceremony, um, which um, for, fortunately I wasn't involved with, um, but could, could, could watch from afar. It was fascinating. So this brings us back to something I alluded to earlier, which is what's in a name? And it, it, it's very clear, we think this is all very easy, but basically we all have two identities. We have our social identity. So I'm Margaret Cox. Um, my family know who I am and I know who they are. My community, my, my relatives all know me, I know them. Um, so it's not just about you, but it's about links. It's about family links, it's about social links. It's about professional links as well, of course. And then you have your genetic identity, which is about your genes. Um, so it's your DNA. And for most people, the, the two are the same, but they aren't always. And this is something that you have to consider in identification processes. And uh, we're dealing with um, communities and people who were alive almost 100 years ago. And Australia in particular, 100 years ago, um, was not the country it is today, just as the UK wasn't. And in terms of um, official, if you like, oversight of things like adoption, whether it's formal or informal, there was none. Um, this followed in the 1920s in Australia. So for our soldiers, there was adoption, there was non-paternity, there was non-maternity taking place. And generally speaking, there is no record of this. And we only had one family which actually came to us saying, we know of something within the family that we think you should be aware of. And um, so some of the soldiers from places, from, from groups of deceased um, burials from warfare will never ever be identified because of the lack of consistency between genetic ID and social ID, but the majority will, and um, thankfully. Um, but it's something that complicates things and, and you have to bear in mind all the way through the process. Now, from the, the War Graves Commission, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, there are three categories of identification for purposes of headstones and commemoration in their cemeteries. The first is the name of the soldier, the name by which they were known during life. And, you know, it was, there were several cases where soldiers had, un, had enlisted under names which were different to their real names, the, the names which they were christened to, for reasons we, we can never know. Um, and those three categories are identification to a name, identification as to which army they fought for, and whether they were unknown to everyone but God. 
Um, and those were things we had to bear in mind um, with the categorizations that we were putting forward as well. And we did our first identification processes in the late winter, early spring and through spring um, of 2010. Um, while we, as we began our work, 249 of, our, of the soldiers were buried in the new cemetery and they were all buried as unknown soldiers. And one soldier's remains were kept in the temporary mortuary and they were properly curated. They weren't left there on their own um, and they were properly curated very securely and respectfully until the July ceremony and um, when they were part of that, that commemorative process, which I'll show you some images of in a moment. Um, but before we get to that stage, I just want to briefly introduce you to some of the complexities around identification. So we basically had uh, four different data sets. We had the anthropology from the buried soldiers um, and principally were concerned with aspects of the body which can be useful when compared against documentation. So enlistment records, for example. So that obviously includes age. Um, age at enlistment is recorded. Um, and you obviously know when the soldiers died, so you can work out their, their age when they died. Now from the skeleton, you cannot, you cannot assess a precise age for, for adults or indeed for children. Um, and the older you are, the greater the disparity of, of aging becomes. So we can, for example, deduce whether someone died between the age of 15 and say 22, 23, but we can't say they were 18. Um, we could similarly deduce that an individual died between the age of 25 and 35. Um, but within all of those ranges, you've got an outer range as well. And that outer range could be as much as 20 years. So you're looking at the best you can do, um, but they're not precise, they're indicators. But, but broadly speaking, we can tell the difference between a soldier who died as a very young adult, so in their late teens, early 20s. We can tell soldiers who died between their early 20s and the age of 30, because the medial clavicle fuses um, at around the age of 30. Um, and then we can tell the soldiers who were older than that but still not very old and then you've got the soldiers with degenerative change to their skeletons which indicates older soldiers um, so age estimation is not very accurate and um, but it's still important stature estimation is more accurate it's based on long bone length to which are applied logarithmic formulae and that will give you a stature estimate of, say, 174 centimetres, plus or minus three. So much more accurate. Um, other things, heel trauma and pathology. So diseases that have happened during life that were chronic, so therefore could have affected bone, which are known about from family records, from other records, from enlistment records. Um, it can also be sort of healed fractures. Uh, it can be um, a broken leg due to an accident, something like that, because the skeleton will still be telling that story. It will give you that information. Uh, dental disease and treatments, not so useful for material from this period um, because we don't have dental records for the soldiers. But what we do have, we have photographs of a lot of them. And for soldiers with significant overbites, so protruding upper teeth at the front, very often you can see that in a photograph. So that kind of thing you'd record. Um, we did record everything about the teeth, but most of it wasn't very helpful for identification. The other thing is that of the enlistment process, gold teeth that were visible at enlistment were recorded as being present. And again, that could be helpful. And the final um, link in this one is perimortem trauma. So trauma occurring around the time of death. So absolutely no healing involved with these, whether it's um, shrapnel injury, blade injury, um, a projectile, say a bullet, for example. And um, all of that would be recorded in great detail because it could be compared with causes of death that were attributed um, by eyewitnesses. Um, there are problems with this. Um, one is that the causes of death attributed may not be accurate. 
And for one soldier, we had three different causes of death from three different eyewitnesses who all apparently saw what happened. And of course, the chaos and the trauma that these men were going through on the battlefield explains why. The other factor is that once a soldier is down, whether they're dead or injured, their bodies are still likely to be hit by projectiles and shrapnel and so forth. Um, and so you can't say for sure that the trauma that you're seeing is what killed the soldier. Um, it could be, it could ha have happened an hour afterwards, five hours afterwards, we don't know. But it's still all very, very useful. Um, the second data set are, is the archaeology. So, and that's principally about indicating, possibly a name, if you're lucky, but it is only an indication, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Religion, so a rosary, for example, would indicate somebody who was a Catholic, and religion was recorded at enlistment. And the anything that indicated the army or the rank of the soldier, all of those things could be helpful. And they would be corroborating evidence towards um, determining an identification. So we've got the historical, what we call historical data. So enlistment records, all of the medical records, all of the military records held um, by the, the Australian War Memorial, for example, um, anything we could glean from families, from newspapers, contemporary newspapers, photographs, anything, anything that was available would be examined and, and its, it's, its possible accuracy and its merit would be determined. But again, that's more corroborative information. And reality is that without the enlistment records, there's no point in determining stature and age at death because you, you, that's the only means you have of having any vaguely, you know, hopefully accurate um, indication of those from their lifetimes. And then we move on to the genetic data, which is where it all gets very complicated. So we're looking at the buried soldiers' DNA and DNA donated from the, the many um, possible genetic relatives, the families. Um, and again, that is a, is a whole different area and a specialist area. And just to mention that from DNA, of course, we've got haplotypes, which are indicators of ethnicity. So we could see from haplotypes that some soldiers are likely to have been what we call bog standard British. Some were born in Central Europe. Um, some were um, um, in part at least Aboriginal. Um, others, we had one individual from Mauritius. Um, his ancestry was extraordinary and it transpired his parents, one was of African descent and one was of Indian descent. So he had very interesting uh, DNA and so on and so forth. We had Scandinavian indicators and, and everything else. Uh, and so that was helpful, but not conclusive, um, but valuable data nevertheless. So to, just to show you some illustrations then of all of these processes that were involved, this is the anthropology mortuary. Um, it's state of the absolutely state of the art. You had five workstations, each with a fixed overhead camera. So the anthropologists could take photographs of the whole of their work ta table. Um, and the basic recording for using photography was that every skeleton would be laid out in the anatomical, true anatomical position, and working shots would be taken to show the condition of the remains. Um, markers of different colours were used to show things like where age of death indicators came from, where trauma had occurred, where disease had been recorded. So you'd have standard photographs for every individual and you'd also have specific ind photographs of individual pathology, so evidence of disease, evidence of trauma, uh, anything unusual, for example. Um, so they, it was very, very well equipped. They, they each also had a computer and they had a live data feed from the site so they can interrogate the archaeologist records for their particular individual um, at all stages. So it was truly integrated and essentially the human remains were coming from the graves and a week after the commencement of the excavation, the anthropologists started work and they completed their work a month after the excavation was completed. So it was very, very quick. Usually it's, there's a much longer gap between archaeology and anthropology. 
So again, these, these aren't, I have to say, these are not from Fromel, but they're sorts of things people are looking at. Um, so when I talked about pre-existing health conditions, you've got uh, on, the, on the left, that's a badly healed fracture, which would of course foreshortening of the affected limb. Um, on the top right, you've got um, a femoral head, which is completely misshapen. Um, and that could reflect something like a congenital dislocation of the hip. It could reflect something like Perth's disease, but essentially that individual would have a limp. Um, and the bottom right, um, what you see is a very sore knee. Um, and whoever had a knee that looked like that would have also had a limp and they would have struggled um, to, to be very mobile. So that's the kind of thing we're recording. In the vain hope there might be something written down about those in relation to our missing soldiers. Um, we used digital radiography. Um, we, we used it on the human remains for helping to diagnose disease. We used it to look at artifacts that were embedded in clay, very fragile, but if you tried to extricate them from the clay, particularly corroded um, badges and the like, um, which you see on Mark's screen there, you can see an Australia uh, badge and you can also see a rising sun badge. But when they were extricated from the clay mass they were in, uh, they, they just disintegrated. So it's a means of recording artifacts um, as well. So that was um, well worth doing. And here's an example. This was a, a very badly corroded object, which turned out to be a cigarette lighter. Um, so very useful. Tool. So in terms of identification, um, there were several artifacts that were recovered that had something with a name on them, and they ranged from dog tags, identity tags, we had five that were legible, and I'm pleased to say that they were all recovered with individuals who did were determined to be that person from DNA and from corroborating anthropology. The, the little matchbox cover you see on the top right um, has got a little silver, it's a base metal, but a little silver plaque that says Cyril Johnson, and that was indeed discovered with the remains of Private Cyril Johnson. And the bottom illustration, you may wonder what on earth you're looking at, but that is the palatal surface of somebody's false teeth, their upper set of their false teeth. And we looked at this and looked at this, trying to work out what the inscription looked like, and you can see it as we could see it, on this image and it looks like an M and a back to front E and an I and a back to front K and it made no sense. But then where the black line is, we put a mirror and when you tilted the inscription up to the mirror, it spelt out Weir and that was found with the body of Private Weir, Private Arthur Weir. And again, um, a whole, you know, very unexpected um, occasions um, like that, but very, very worthwhile. And I have to say, and it's completely, I'm not going to go into this today, but the level of sophistication of some of the treatments that the soldiers had had on their teeth, which we understand was mostly done in Turkey when, when they were at Gallipoli, was really sophisticated. Some amazing ventures, really extraordinary ventures, um, and very sophisticated fillings. Uh, including white fillings, which I'd assumed were developed in you know more recent decades. I mean, they're now falling out of favour, apparently. But um, but we were astonished by that. Now, it's a, I think I've already mentioned that Oxford came up with this degree, this method of gauging contextual security of ob objects. Um, it's very, very important. So, for example, if you found a dog tag, was it recovered in the region of, of a soldier's chest, neck, or was it recorded by the hip or somewhere else? Um, because we know that soldiers took stuff, they swapped things, they played cards for things. It's, it's well documented. Um, and you could never be sure with anything that was portable, whether it was actually with the soldier it started off being with. Now, the exception I would think is Private Weir's false teeth. I don't really think anyone would have wanted those um, as a prize in the game of cards. But most other things were very, very portable. But, but generally all of the things we could read inscriptions on were with the person they were supposed to be with. Um, again, 
just to get working shots for you, this is, we had an artifact suite of the Fines Laboratory where some basic conservation was undertaken, huge levels of recording. Um, and Marcial de la Bar, who you see here, um, looking at through, through the lens, um, he used to work for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, he's now retired, but he's the individual who set up the original from our museum. He worked very closely with Oxford's finds team in particular, because he was very, very au fait with the particularities of uh, the, the, the types of militaria that were found with soldiers um, in, on the Flanders battlefields. And Martial, um, who's an absolute treasure, um, was very, very helpful to the whole process. Again, a few more objects, again, nice things to see. The pipe you see on the left was very interesting because basically it had one set of initials that had been over-inscribed with another. And the final set matched the soldier that they were found with. Uh, the, the middle um, illustration of the ring uh, says, love from Aunt Julie, uh, 1910, and that's noted in that soldier's enlistment record. And finally, you see a beautifully um, preserved dog tag, uh, which uh, probably one of the best preserved ones that we had of Private Kendall. So again, some military objects that were found, the, the proverbial buttons, um, Australian sewed badges, rising sun badges and the Australian jacket belt buckle. And that was so important because it was an instant indicator it was an Australian soldier. Um, the, the British buckle was rectangular rather than oval. Um, so, and we did find, um, I don't think we did actually find any. No, I'm sure we didn't. So moving on to the dreaded DNA, um, now, my colleague Peter Jones was our DNA um, boffin, and Peter's a very, very experienced molecular geneticist. So he guided this whole process um, and, and dealt directly with LGC. Um, so, and, and was, was just superb. He really does know the subject inside out. But basically, given bearing in mind, we undertook this project initially in 2009 was the excavation and most of the DNA analysis took place 2009-2010. At that time, next generation sequencing was not around to be used. So we had to use mitochondrial DNA and the YSTR. And they're not terribly accurate. Um, and this is one of the big problems that you have because everyone thinks that DNA is a golden bullet. Oh, you know, they're using DNA, so it's a done deal but it's not like that, um, especially with historical cases. So the first thing we did was the pilot study, which I've mentioned. Um, the next thing to mention is that we had to prevent contamination at all stages of the project. So right from excavation, and you see the suited and booted um, archeologists, um, to the point where these were handed over to um, the scene of crime officer, who was also in forensic um, garments and protection, and they were put by her into freezers and refrigerators. Um, so the anthropologists didn't have to wear this degree of closure because the parts of the human skeleton used for the DNA analysis were never handled by them. Uh, so it was vital to prevent contamination. And indeed, the, what we set up was an elimination database. So everyone working on the project had their DNA profile done to make sure that none of us contaminated anything by any means contaminated anything. And I'm pleased to say we didn't, which is great. Um, obviously everything was done forensically. So appropriate logging, labeling and storage, um, chain of custody and contextual security were absolutely paramount because if we got the DNA sample from a body and then mistakenly thought it was from another body, everything's blown out of the, you know, the water, frankly, in terms of, of meaningful identifications. So we used um, barcoding for, um, for all of the labeling of, of all of the, of, of the DNA samples and everything associated with them, which for the archeologists was the first, they'd never used barcoding before, but I think they're using it more now. Um, and another vital thing to appreciate with, with the use of DNA um, in historical cases is the level of proof 
And you cannot, in our opinion, um, determine an identification at beyond reasonable doubt when you're using it, dealing with historical cases, um, particularly when you're reliant on mitochondrial DNA and the YSTR. And the level of proof that we worked to was substantially more likely than not with clear and convincing evidence. So basically, the DNA match that was um, eventually secured, everything else associated with that soldier had to corroborate that match. If it didn't, then it was overturned. So if, for example, the DNA was so saying, this is Private Jones, he was 18 and five foot four, but the anthropology is saying, but this is a 45 year old and he was five foot 10, then that we had to conclude there was non-paternity or non-maternity or adoption. Um, so that level of disparity would be completely unacceptable. So they, the aging and sexing, sorry, not the sexing, the stature estimate and what have you all had to corroborate um, for a match to, to be upheld. And the problems we had with the, the DNA that we were able to use at this time were that the maximum probability values for our statistics, and this is getting horribly complicated and I'm sorry about it, but it's important, for the mitochondrial DNA, the strongest match you could have is one in 1,915. Now you don't see anything like that on CSI or anything else you watch on the television. It's always one in 20 million uh, or something similar. And for the Y, it was one in 3,387. And I'm not going to go into why those were the maximum strongest levels you could have, but believe me, they were. Um, and if you had both the mitochondrial and a Y donors for particular individuals, then you double your values, which gave you a maximum strength of one in one of 6.4 million, uh, which of course is much, much better. But most often we didn't have donors from both sides of the family. And that's the reality of trying to identify people virtually 100 years after they died. And again, I'm not going to go into why that is. Um, it, we have written about this and it's, um, it's complicated, but it's real. So we were advised by a genetic statistician that for 250 subjects, our match probability had to be over one in 1,000. Otherwise, it wasn't acceptable, even with corroborating anthropology. So that's the that's what we were working to, and it was a challenge, I can tell you. But you know, you 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 do the best you can with the parameters you've got, with the evidence types you've got. But you absolutely have to recognise the limitations um, and potential of the different approaches and the different data sets. And to do anything else is dishonest, and you're not doing anyone any favours. In fact, it's positively dis discourteous to, to the soldiers and to the families. So once you've been through the, all of this, um, even before then, um, coming back to the commemoration, um, and in July 2010, we laid the 250th soldier to rest um, in Fromel with the most amazing ceremony. There were thousands of people there, um, many thousands from Australia, I have to say. It was an extraordinary event. And the final soldier, who still remains unidentified, he's an unknown soldier, and was carried from the temporary mortuary site to the new cemetery um, on a World War I gun carriage, um, which was very, very fitting. And you can see the crowds um, again in the background, but the gun carriage was escorted by um, representatives of the, the monarchy, um, by the British and Australian governments. And you can see here our present king at that time representing our late queen. Um, Quentin Bryce was the governor general of Australia. Ken Gillespie is the head of Australian army and so on and so forth. So it was an amazing day with all sorts of different people there. Um, and it was a privilege to be a part of it. And as things stand in terms of armies and the three, if you like, the three categories of, of identification, we've identified 166 soldiers up to 2020. Um, we know that 235 fought for the AIF, 
and two possibly for, for the British Army, but that's a bit shaky. Um, and 13 remain unknown to, known only known to God. And again, I put up a couple of headstones. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see the stone um, from um, Lieutenant Beryl Mendelssohn, who I'll talk about later. Um, he was one of two Jewish soldiers that were recovered from the mass graves. The second one has not yet been identified um, and may never be identified, unfortunately. And the stone you see on your right, for those of you who know your Flanders cemeteries, you'll know this isn't from El, but this is a headstone for 2nd Lieutenant Albert Pratt, um, who was called Bert Pratt. And he was ostensibly buried at Poissier Cemetery, but he was one of the 250 who were recovered from Fromal, um, identified on the basis of DNA and corroborating anthropology and archaeology. And when the original records for his burial at Poissier were interrogated, they were very, very, very flaky. And it seemed unlikely anyway, because normally the soldiers were buried close to where they fell. And this is quite some way from Fromal. But he now sports a, a nice um, uh, headstone that's in line with the others um, in the cemetery, but, but with, still with the Australian um, Rising Sun badge um, on the top. So, as I said, we've identified 166 men, such as this one. And this is um, Private Albert Victor Monflay, who was called Vic. And he's a very interesting individual. He's a soldier I mentioned who was born in Mauritius of mixed ancestry. Um, and his family have been very, very helpful in providing information about him for a, a book we published last year. And, um, and, and we've learned a lot about that family at the time when they left um, Mauritius and came to Australia, work, working almost certainly for the French government. Um, so, at this stage, I'm going to stop um, and then I hope we can all have a break and stretch our legs and then I'll talk about the legacies of Fromel. Well, what I want to spend the next sort of 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour talking to you about is the legacy of Fromel. And this is something that's become much clearer to, to me and to my colleagues um, really over the last couple of years. And we, we recently produced this, this new book that we wrote principally for the families of the soldiers and other people who are interested who aren't scientists, which entailed us making contact with lots of families, um, talking to the, the groups of enthusiasts, particularly in Australia, to, to, to find out what motivated them and from their perspective, what the benefits have been um, and so on and so forth. And the, the sort of process for me has probably been as overwhelming as everything else on the Fromel project. And, and I suppose I should, should also mention that for me, it's been an enormous honor and a privilege to have been involved in this project um, because it means so much to so many people. Um, and it's, it's humbling really. So I'm, what I'm not gonna do now is talk about the legacies in terms of how we've moved the sciences that we were involved with on. We've written about that in all the, the usual places and that's there if you want to see it, because I want to talk about the more human side of it, if if if, if you'll bear with me. Um, so it's a bit of an indulgence, I think, in some ways, but I think we mustn't forget that our soldiers, um, from for them, their experiences of going to war, and many of them were very young, not all of them, but but mostly, I think the, the mean age was about 26 or something like that of our group of, um, of 250. But, you know, some of them would have never left the, the, the small places they lived in, if they lived in rural areas or if they lived in cities and towns, probably never left their towns um, before this. And then suddenly they're thrown into this, this machine that, um, engineers transport across oceans and across deserts and across continents. Um, and it must have been quite overwhelming in many ways for them um, with long sea journeys, uh, boat journeys, train journeys, deserts, medieval cities of France and Europe, 
not to mention the pyramids and, and some of the, the wonders of, of Egypt, um, that the landscapes they would have seen, which would have, you know, the Australian landscapes vary so much, it's hard to generalize, but, you know, as, as such as that varies, the, the variation across the different regions they traveled through would have been massive. Different climates, they had to change their uniform type um, from the desert uniform uh, to, to one more appropriate to Flanders um, en route, um, so different cultures. And then finally, to be faced with the, the ecology of the battlefield, which that in itself is a fascinating subject, which has been written about um, um, and is very well worth, worth looking at. Um, so we mustn't lose sight of that. What it must, we can't really imagine what it felt like for these men. Um, but they they end up in this foreign country. I don't suppose some of them really knew why on earth this war was happening. Um, we could have told you the name of the vice duke who'd, who'd been assassinated and so on and so forth. But they would have gone off with great gusto. And the, the, the film about the German soldiers that's recently won multiple awards sort of resonates somewhat with enthusiastic young men going... Um, going to the slaughter. Um, but what was left after their deaths, um, their sudden dramatic, and for most would have been horrendous deaths, um, were families that were completely disrupted, um, degrees of loss um, that are unimaginable unless you've experienced it. There would have been parents, wives, sweethearts, brothers, sisters, children, all bereft, uh, and many of them plunged into financial hardship with, with no breadwinner left in their families. And the, the illustrations on here just show you, that's Beryl Mendelssohn again, the soldier I referred to earlier, outside of his tent, he was an officer. Um, this is in Egypt, and underneath is what Fromel looked like after the battle. Um, so, you know, and again, it's about the this is discord, if you like, and the, the differences between them all. So their journeys, and which led to their deaths, would have been amazing, um, overwhelming, uh, and horrendous, uh, in equal measure, probably. But I want to think a bit about the, their families and friends, and, and the sort of cases we, we came across. Um, there was Lieutenant Eric Chinner, and his family were most helpful in providing information for us and provided these images um, to me, which, are, which I much appreciate. And on the right, you see Eric's fiance, uh, Gladys Dunn, um, who's beautiful without a shadow of a doubt. And you see around her neck that she's wearing a necklace and you see inside the, the locket on the left and that's her, her fiance taken when he was in uniform before he went to France. Uh, she never saw him again, and she never got over it. She never married. She apparently wore that locket throughout her life, and, and her life was as truncated as his was left, was, was lost. Um, and the impacts, you know, range from Gladys's story. Um, Victor Monfey, who I mentioned earlier and showed you a picture of it, you take every excuse to show pictures of Victor because he is rather gorgeous. Um, but he came from this very, very interesting mixed race family. Um, and there's his father and his mother were, was of European extraction. So as a family, they had some challenging times. Um, racism is nothing new. Um, and, and they would have had some battles of their own to face, which they fought gallantly. And they too, the Monflay family, too, provided a lot of information about the family up to the point of the war. But... I've had very little information that the the loss had longer term impacts on the family. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't, but I, I don't know about those. Um, the Wilson brothers is one of the most extraordinary stories. And you see Sam and Eric Wilson to the front with the inset picture of their brother James. All three fought at Fromel. Um, James, who was the youngest, um, he was only just old enough to enlist. Uh, his father had to sign his enlistment application. Um, for, James survived, but the other two, Sam and Eric, both died. And um, we've got details, uh, written accounts in letters, but also in the local newspaper. 
about how their parents, and they were elderly parents, these two boys were the youngest of a very, very large family. And their parents were, Sam actually wrote to his mother and he calls her dear old mother. Um, and that is a term of infection, presumably, but it's also real, she was an old mum. But she was stoical and she had huge faith and she apparently got letters on three consecutive days. The first to say a son was missing in action, the second to say a son was killed, and the third to say another son had been killed. And she came to terms with this ostensibly by accepting God's will. Um, now the Wilson brother story is quite remarkable because if you look in the German death list, they're listed several hundreds of soldiers apart. Yet they were buried almost side by side in the same grave by the Germans. We don't know where they were on the battlefield when they were killed. We, we have a rough idea where Eric was, but not where Sam was. Um, and we didn't know that they had been very close to each other until we did the first identifications. When both were identified, they were separated out on the basis of the anthropology because one was younger and shorter than the other. Um, but when the positions of the soldiers in the new cemetery was decided at the outset of the cemetery design um, phase, the, the, the question arose as to what order they should be buried in, in numerical order. And during the excavation, this Oxford gave the soldiers consecutive numbers as they were found, as they were first exposed, they were given a number by the scene of crime officer. They were consecutive, they could be in the same grave, they could move, because two graves were always excavated simultaneously. So she, she could be going from one grave to another and back again, or be in one grave all morning and the other all afternoon. Um, and when we did the identifications and the headstones were allocated, we appreciated then that because the scene of crime officer just happened to be in that grave at the point which those two skeletons that were side by side were excavated, they were given concurrent numbers. And so from being buried by the soldiers side by side, they were buried by the Commonwealth War Graves, completely coincidentally side by side where they remain today, which is absolutely extraordinary. And, and I think what's really extraordinary is why they were buried together in the first place, because ostensibly Jim Monroe um, from the FFI has, has looked at this and, and, and sort, of, uh, sort of concludes that they shouldn't have been, but they were. And did somebody, one of the soldiers who was collecting documentation from the dead bodies, find the two Wilson boys or remember that he'd seen a Wilson earlier on or something and put them together? Was it compassion? Was it absolute coincidence? We can never know, but that is an extraordinary thing which stays with us and will stay with us. But their story and the impact of the loss of them on their family was, was very different from, from, from those on other families. And I want to just talk a little bit about Herbert Bolt, who was called Nutsy, and you can see him here, um, standing up next to his wife and his little, his little daughter. And I've been in contact with a granddaughter, uh, I think Nutsy's granddaughter, called, whose name is Josie Shelley. And, and she provided this picture, which you see of a group of soldiers. And, and Nutsy, Herbert Bolt, is on the bottom left. And in the middle and the top is Frank Johnson. And they apparently were friends before they enlisted. And they both died at Fromel. And when this project started and the Bolt family were tasked with trying to find appropriate DNA donors. And this applied to lots of families. Families found other members of their families they didn't even know about. And it brought some families together trying to find an appropriate donor. And I haven't talked at all about um, how you become an appropriate donor because not everyone who's descended from somebody is uh, an, what we call genetically informative. That's a whole new field. Um, but it brought big families, wider families together, just this whole process. 
And the Bolt family was no exception. And there were many others that were very, very similar. The Cuxton family, for example. And on the centenary of the Battle of Formel, the Bolt family had made contact with the Johnson family. And the two families, there were over 100 people there, had a, a sort of, a, a, if you like, a, a Formel mates reunion. Um, and they celebrated their, their ancestors and celebrated their loss. And um, so it's brought individual families together, but it's brought different families together in different ways. And, and again, that's extraordinary. Um, and I wanted to, the other end of, of extreme of that, if you like, is this is a list of soldiers that we identified in 2019. And at the bottom, you see Private Peter Shannon, age 35. And um, he was a very interesting case uh, because he was clearly an older man um, and the degenerative change to his back and the disease in his back uh, was so extreme that he almost looked much older um, in terms of skeletal age. Um, but it turned out that he was a sheep shearer. And when you look into what sheep shearers at the turn of the century were doing, it's not at all surprising he had a completely ruined back um, and right shoulder. But his donor, who was found after a couple of years of searching by a diligent genetic, uh, genealogist, um, he knew nothing about having a, an ancestor of Fromel. Um, and the, the descendant, the donor, um, was Emeritus Professor Pat Shannon of Dublin University. Um, who I've been privileged to meet. And his story is completely different again, because he didn't know about, he never heard of Fromel, didn't know he had this um, distant cousin. And, and again, to show how difficult it could be to trace um, informative donors, the common ancestor of these two men was Peter Shannon's three times great-grandfather and Pat Shannon's four times great-grandfather. And those paternal lines were followed down in different, slightly different directions from a brother um, to, to get the match. Um, and again, you know, so some families, the effects were immediate and prolonged. We don't know very much about the impact of, of Peter's loss on his immediate family. He wasn't married and didn't have children. And I think both of his parents had died by the time the war broke out, but he had sisters and they would have grieved. Um, an example of somebody's words, you know, in their own words, you know, somebody's feelings in their own words. This is a knitted wreath that somebody placed on the grave um, in, in July 1916. Um, and this is the wreath commemorating the loss of Justin Breguet, who, uh, who was originally a French extraction. And I don't know if you can read this, but if you, I better read it in case you can't, because I don't know how you're seeing it. But in distant France, they're lying, called by a passing shell. They were buried by their comrades, the boy they loved, who loved them well. They went with the hope of returning, along with their comrades so brave, and with many a hero, they're sleeping in a soldier's on a grave. And then it goes on to say what an honour it is to represent the family, and that they pay their respects to their long lost relative who was 19 when he died and gave up his life. And, you know, it makes the work, makes you realize how important the work is to people today. Some people have said, why do you bother? Um, you know, these men died a long time ago, who cares? But lots of people care. And here's another example, Marjorie Whitfield, um, who was, I think she's a granddaughter of, or a grandniece of Private Harry Willis, who you see in the photo. And this is her joy um, when she realized that her, her ancestor had been recovered. He'd never been forgotten. And you read stories and accounts of how the, the, the mothers, if you like, of, of these sons never spoke about their loss and the impact that had on the families going forward. And you get what we call family law. So there will be tales in families of lost soldiers and the impacts that that loss has. And loss can take various forms and various shapes, depending on individuals, depending on circumstances. And this family, um, 
for me, um, showed the breadth of diversity of the, of the impact, if you like, um, and really illustrates how families can be completely fractured um, by the loss of a soldier, which very often when it's combined with other things going on within the family group and within life generally at the time, can cause huge damage within families and cause misery for generations. Um, and essentially, where there is, if you like, prolonged pain through generations from loss and from the damage to a very close relative um, on other, and other surviving children, that can have all sorts of different impacts. Um, and some of them can be very negative, but they don't have to be. And I want to, to show you some words. And, and you remember Beryl Mendelssohn, who I showed you his headstone and also a picture of him outside of his tent. And his niece, uh, Tyre Mellison, says, and you can read this, it's impossible to properly account for the impact on families of the scarifying trauma and grief of the brutal death of fathers, husbands, sons and brothers. When there is no body to mourn, grief is compounded, there is no end. And she goes on to say that anger and bitterness cause ripples and outcomes that ultimately surpass these negative emotions and create change for the greater good. And you might wonder what she means. And basically, she's referring to um, her cousin, who was Professor Emeritus Professor Fred Mendelssohn, and he's an eminent neuroscientist. And when I told Peter this story, um, Peter Jones, he just said, you know, he really is a big cheese in the science world. But one of the, for the mother, um, Beryl Mendelssohn's mother was called Abigail and she was a widow. She was widowed young and she had eight, eight children or six children. I think it was six children. And Beryl was the third child. So she was widowed with a young family um, and to her chagrin, her middle son joins up when the war breaks out. Um, and she was not happy because I think essentially she was what we would now call a pacifist. She didn't agree with the war, but Beryl went off to war and was killed. And despite Abigail saying don't, um, her other son Oscar also joined up, but he survived. Um, and Oscar's, I think Fred is Oscar's son, Fred Mendelssohn. And you read in family letters um, descriptions of the impact of the bitterness and anger from Abigail, who was furious at being widowed, who was, you know, totally bereft of losing a son um, and just couldn't accept the, if you like, everything bad that came out of the war. She hated the Germans, despite Mendelssohn being a German name and, and, and you know, grandparents from, from German stock. And this is the environment her surviving children lived in. But most of her children, the children and grandchildren, um, have become pacifists. And Fred Mendelssohn was no exception. And with colleagues, um, I think in Melbourne, where he worked, um, in 2007, they established something called ICAM, which was an effort to bring together um, a movement to, to try and, if you like, eliminate and prohibit nuclear weapons. And you can, I think with the eye of faith, but I think his whole, if you like, his whole being about being anti such awful weapons can possibly be traced back to feelings and emotions that came through the family originally from Abigail. And um, in 2017, ICANN was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. And in 2021, the International Treaty for the Prevention and whatever of nuclear weapons and proliferation came into force. And this, I think, can all be traced back to the impact of Beryl's death on his mother and the impacts of her feelings of loss and grief and anger on other children and their children. And I'm going to stop there.
Um, because I think that while there's quite clear, there's a lot of loss, there's also potential, potential for a lot of good to come from really awful things. And you may not agree with me, you may think I'm being fanciful and putting two and two together and making 16. Um, but I want to end there um, because for me, this story is, is one that is so enriching um, and set alongside other stories from other families and the impacts of Fromel on them. For example, the Bolt family, um, one of Nazis, I think he would be a great nephew now, um, has done very well in business and he actually um, has got his own racetrack um, before, I think it's a Formula One tra race track, track, I'm not entirely sure, um, but that is called the Fromel Pheasant Wood racetrack. Um, so the diversity of impacts and reactions to the, the losses of Fromel and also the recovery of the bodies and the identifications is huge. And I would just like to end by saying it has been truly wonderful to have been a part of this, um, this journey um, as a scientist and as a human being. And thank you very much for listening. Margaret, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. Quite a number of questions, um, including one uh, that actually came in this afternoon um, from uh, Philomena Manson, and um, who unfortunately couldn't join us today owing to work commitments but um philomena asks as a relative of one of the missing of the song i would like to know if it's possible to leave dna in the event however unlikely that my great uncle could be identified if remains were found and if so what company would you recommend to use for this if there is one well that's a, that's a very interesting question there are lots of complexities of course the first one is that you've got to be the right relative to leave the DNA. And um, Philomena may or may not be genetically informative in terms of her uncle. Um, so a use, useful relatives for her uncle are likely to be um, either her uncle's brothers, which I guess would include her father, and their sons and even their sons, depending on how far the line it comes down. So for the male line, it has to be the males, the males, the males. And then for the maternal DNA, you have to look at um, his mother's um, DNA, which would be passed down through her daughters and their daughters. So you have to find the right person to start with. Um, there are a large number of companies that will do DNA profiles. Um, and But the, the reality is, that unless the Commonwealth War Graves Commission um, is likely to sort of take this kind of donation on board, um, you, you have to consider whether it's actually worth doing. And, you know, I mean, it could be because I guess you, you just need to store the data, store the profiles, but you would need to talk to, to a geneticist to start with um, to make sure that you are the right person to be given that DNA. Um, to, be, to to have their DNA profiled. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just joined us is Bill Twist. Margaret, fascinating, uh, as Lucas said. Uh, you alluded early on to your wider interest in or wider uh, activities in, in, in forensic archaeology. I wondered whether any of your activities in, 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 in France at Fromel had been informed or went on to, to advise the United States programme that they're missing in action, who are looking at uh, people who are lost in Vietnam. I think it's particularly air crews. I appreciate it's a totally different scale. You know, they're, they're looking at single or, or probably pairs of, uh, of bodies long since buried, but then you're looking at, at, at many, many hundreds. Yeah, um, well, it's uh, who knows is the answer really, but the, the, the United States operation is very well honed. It's very well funded. And they will almost certainly take note of what everyone else is doing. They will read all the publications about other projects elsewhere. And um, so I, I don't know the answer, to be honest, Bill. Um, I could ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but they 
um, you know, again, they do very often with 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 air crews, and a lot of them will have gone down in the sea. Um, and I mean, st some still are recovered, but you know, they will have a, a whole range of um, challenges that are different from bodies buried in wet clay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I have actually visited the whole the institution in Hawaii. Um, used to be called JPAC, isn't any longer, um, to see see their operation. And it is in, really impressive. They've got great people, shed loads of money, um, and uh, everything they want in terms of equipment, publications, etc. So I'm Thank very you. envious. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> I have a question from um, uh, Melvin Sexton and... Um, Melvin asks, please ask about the funding of the project and was it possible to forecast a cost before the work was started? Um, well, when we, when the, the, if you like, the archaeology and the uh, DNA analysis went out to tender, the organisations that were approached were asked for expressions of interest and approximate costs. Um, so they would have had some idea, but then of course there, there are all the other costs. The costs were shared between the British and the Australians and um, work that's been done since 2015 has been borne by Australia alone. But to be honest, it's only been more DNA analysis. The big costs were the, the, the origin, the archeology span and anthropology and the initial torch of DNA analyses. That was where the money would have been spent in the first place. Um, so they would have had a rough idea because obviously once the project designs have been properly worked up and more specific costings could be put in, um, then you know, costs would, would shift. But it did matter. I mean, I, my, my role in the tendering process for the archaeology and anthropology was simply to comment on the scientific um, side and the staffing size and that kind of thing, that the whole issues around cost uh, around um, compliance and everything else were dealt with by experts in those fields, people who are used to dealing with, with quite large projects, because we are talking about many millions of pounds uh, being spent uh, at the outset. So it's a lot of money. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, question from Becca Bernstein, um, and who says, um, were there other battlefields that had this level of excavation and identification of fallen soldiers? No, never. No, this is the first. <laughs> this, which is why it was one a huge privilege to be asked to, to, to oversee the, the archaeology and anthropology and identification. Um, but secondly, real challenge. Um, uh, it was a, a great opportunity to bring together knowledge and information from a wide range of sources and I've had quite a diverse career anyway um, and so much of that came into play um, so no and, and nothing like it's been done since. Great thank you very much. A couple more where they've asked if I could ask the question on um, their behalf. Um, really uh, interesting question from uh, Stephen Mason um how were families located were they approached and if so how identified or did they come forward based on family knowledge of ancestor lost in the war or uh... a bit of a mixture really i mean initially um we were involved peter and i were involved with the british effort to trace families um because the historical work that was undertaken um sort of in 2007, 2008, suggested strongly there'd be British and Australian soldiers buried in the graves. So th the British search for families was done through the regimental associations in the first place, because various regiments, the Burks, the Bucks, the Glocks, et cetera, were all involved. Um, and they were very, very helpful. Things like local radio, TV, um, the project was, was aired. Um, and you know, calls for people who believe they'd lost relatives at Fromal um, were, were brought forward, and and they were asked to produce uh, evidence to suggest how you know how the relationship was, and um, there was verification through genealogy, of course, 
The Australian side was different because such a big country, um, lots of publicity went out um, and, and it did rely very heavily on people coming forward. They, they still are coming forward, of course. Um, and, and also remember that a lot of the soldiers who fought for the Australian army, their families aren't in Australia. Um, they, they, they were born in Australia, a lot of them. So there are British families and other European families um, who are involved with the loss of soldiers who fought for the AIF. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it touches lots of nationalities. But in Australia and in the UK, through um, Triple JC um, in England, um, lots of effort been expended trying to track down the families. A whole team um, were, were working on it in England. And, and the same in Australia, lots of uh, voluntary groups in Australia as well, um, who were involved with the, you know, the, the, the drive and the push for, for Formel to happen in the first place. Um, huge, huge movement, huge, huge momentum. But of course, it all had to be verified genetically. And, you know, fa I remember during the identification process, we sit there looking at family trees and DNA profiles and the anthropology and the archaeology, um, you know, and it all had to, it all had to, to add up. It had to be verified. Fascinating. Thank you. Paul Cobb has just joined us. And um, Paul, if you would like to ask your question directly. OK, uh, yeah, I was in from the start. Um, I'm the author of From L 1916, um, so got a real interest in what came after the uh, discovery of, of, of the grave. Now, <clears throat> clearly, some of it was a little bit controversial. And I know that there have been questions asked about a, a grave down at Bullocor. Um, I'm also aware that it's not within the remit of the War Graves Commission to actually actively search for remains. Uh, but can you see a project like this being being repeated on the Western Front? Well, I wish I wish I could say yes. Um, um, uh, firstly, congratulations on your wonderful book. It's very helpful to me. Thank finally, you. head around the battle. Um, um, I don't know is the answer. I suspect that the British aren't going to do it. I mean, they they're very clear about it. They Britain was involved in this because they they kind of had to be. Um, the Australians were going to do it anyway. And there were likely to be British soldiers buried there, so they had to participate. Mm. Um, well, I don't suppose they had to, but they chose to participate. But but various people from Veterans Affairs would say that you know that they fundamentally didn't agree with going out looking for the dead. Um, there were too many, um, so many of the dead lying in Flanders fields can never be identified because um, it's not obvious even which event they come from. Um, they could have been robbed by metal detectorists looking for loot to sell to tourists, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think, and I'm not, obviously I'm not um, able to speak for the, for the commission, but as far as I know, it's not something that's on their minds. <laughs> um, it's not part of their, their general remit. But I think, you know, the, 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 the commission is, is about commemoration and memorialization principally yeah. today and um and in the veterans affairs group and i no longer have contact with them because that was back in 2009 and 10 we were in regular contact um they they were very plain then that going out and looking is not on their agenda mm. okay Thank it's, very much. it's also a huge amount of money to spend indeed um, yeah. and the result you know the, i remember at the time we were doing this thinking because I know there was a lot of publicity about our own troops not having good enough boots. You know, it was a bit ironic that the Fromel soldiers' boots were taken by, if they were good, they were taken by the Germans mm. to be used. Um, so, yeah, it's it's complicated, isn't it, really, on all levels, both, both morally and... Um, but again, fundamentally, it comes down to the organisations involved because there's very, all the permissions that have to be given Mm. Uh, to excavate in different countries, um, different mandates are required, funding's required, um, and obviously public support's hugely important as well. But I think that's almost a given 
Um, mm. I've had quite a few people have said to me, I don't, you shouldn't be doing this. It's, it's a waste of money. The money could be spent more usefully on the living. Um, I can argue that the, the living benefit from projects like this hugely. Um, and I truly believe that, but I'm not unsympathetic to that argument either. Uh, especially when you see things like what's happening in um, the Ukraine and in Turkey and Syria. So um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Multifaceted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've only really got the time for uh, one more question, but it's a, it's a, it's a complementary question to what you've just been discussing. Nicholas Wheatley has asked, did the field work provide any opportunities for students or trainees? Using experienced people is good, but how do people gain the required experience? Uh, no, it, it wasn't possible. I mean, in an ideal world where you had lots of time, that would have been the way to do it, but we didn't have time. The, the timing of the whole project was uh, there was a start point and an end point. The start point was was when I guess when Oxford did their evaluation in two thousand and eight and categorically showed there was a, there were graves. The end point was always going to be July twenty ten when the new cemetery had to have been constructed and finished and where some soldiers had to have been identified. And within those two dates. To do what we did was quite an achievement to get the project going uh, and one thing or another took an awful lot. I mean, I worked, I gave up my job, at, you know, I gave up my university post to work up full time on for now. Um, and I've never regretted that, um, except when I look at my pension, but we won't go there. But, um, you know, it's uh, everything is driven by parameters which are unfortunate, but in an ideal world, of course, you would have trainees. But we didn't, but what we did have was we had some people who were early on in their careers. So um, particularly on the archeological side, um, there was scope within the project and within the time scale to have less experienced people working alongside very experienced people. Um, but in terms of what we would call real trainees, then no, there just wasn't scope, unfortunately. And I think that is always, and I am conscious there are loads of questions that we just haven't had time for. And I would say thank you to everyone that, that asked. Um, um, really, it's been the most fascinating talk. Um, I was riveted through that. So thank you so much, Professor Margaret Cox, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parlez-vous.